doing uh, a lot of work, a lot of activity today. This is my second live stream for the day, but that's because I really wanted to bring this guest on and I've been looking forward to speaking to him so much. And I had to rearrange the event last time because uh, vaccination bookings and things like that, things that couldn't be changed. And thankfully, Dan has agreed to come back onto the show. But look, what I want to explain before we get started is, as a speaker, as someone who does a lot of coaching and speaking, and someone who has a really deep fascination with persuasion and public speaking skills, it amazes me that it took me so long to ever hear about rhetoric and the art of rhetoric as a persuasion skill, as a tool of persuasion. And when I did, it's like, oh my goodness, there's this whole thing here, and I didn't even know it was there. And it's a whole big field of study, loads of people do learn about it, it tends to be more applied in legal and political arenas than anywhere else. But as a speaker, as a presenter, you should know about this. And if you don't, then this can be your introduction to the art of rhetoric as we speak with a rhetoric professor, a doctor of rhetoric. His name is Dan French, and he has a podcast which is called Rhetoric Warriors. He has a new book out, which is the 21 Colosseums of Persuasion. I've been checking it out. It is pretty darn good. And I know you're gonna love this conversation here. So Dan will be with us after the titles. If you are interested in persuasion skills and if you are unfamiliar with rhetoric and you think, well, this could be interesting, or perhaps you do know a bit about it and you would like a bit of a refresher course, you are in the right place. So stick with us. We'll be back just after the titles. Welcome to Speaking Influence, the show about persuasive presentation skills and ethical influence for today's business leaders. Many podcasters now agree that live streaming is the future of podcasting. If you want to get started with live streaming, my recommendation and the channel I use is Restream.io. Check the link in the show notes and after your first live stream, you will receive a $10 Restream cashback. Well, welcome to the show, Dan French. It's great to be speaking with you. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, John, how's it going? It's going really well. And I have been so much looking forward to this conversation because this is the first time I've had a professor of rhetoric on my show. And I can't believe it's the first time, but I have had a political speech writer. He was great. And I know the people who enjoyed that show, which is my most downloaded show so far, are also going to enjoy this show as well. So Dan, please, for the benefit of our audience, please tell us what you do. What is a rhetoric professor? So, uh, real quick background. I don't know. What do you want to know? Rhetoric? Or do you want to my one of my entry into rhetoric? Well, let's let's start with what rhetoric is, and then perhaps tell us where you first uh, discovered it and your interest in that came from. So, my simplest definition of rhetoric it's the uh, it's the art of highly designed messaging, like. I usually set up two polls here about there are people that are expressive and there are people that are rhetorical and expressive people tend to not work on their messaging before they say it. Like most people don't even know what's going to come out of their mouth before they say it. They hear it at the exact same time that their listeners hear it. And right. those are expressive people. And especially those who, you know, like to do natural communication, supposedly natural, a natural communication, Expressive communication is valorized, as that's that's the way you should talk. Uh, rhetoricians never let a message out before they work on it. Like it's a it's it's literally highly designed messaging, so that you want more control, and it's especially used when the stakes are high, when it's a very important situation, when it costs a lot of money in business to get a, a message out, when there's political effects on the line, uh, and religion. Is, is high use of rhetoric. So there's a lot of use of rhetoric in very high stakes environments. So that's the first thing is just, it's a distinction between sort of natural flowing communication versus practiced, performed, scripted, designed communication. Okay. And it that's goes all the way back. back. It, like this has been studied since the Greeks. The Greeks, the trivium was grammar, rhetoric, and um, why do I always forget the third one? grammar, rhetoric, and something. But you had to take these before you could take the uh, the rest of the courses in the Greek. Hmm. Was uh, it philosophy, the third tradition. one? Or? What? Was it philosophy, the third one? No, it was another no. one, like a language one here. I can find it okay. real quick. <laughs> I, uh, but rhetoric for the Greeks started when they start when with the courts. 
and they started to study why some people were winning and other people weren't. And they, um, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Why do I forget logic? I literally have a <laughs> seminar on logic anyway. So they were studying courts, how people argued in courts. And they were seeing that some people won, even if they were guilty, some people lost, even if they were innocent, so on and so on. And they would abstract the techniques and then sell those as instruction. And that was the sophists. That's where the word sophistication came from. It was a school of study of techniques. And then Aristotle and Plato jumped in and were like, well, there's ethics in here. And should you persuade people this way? And it became, you know, a thing. And so it's been around for 2,500 years. They've been studying persuasion in public for 2,500 years. It, yeah. The reason why people don't know rhetoric as an academic area is because in the Middle Ages, the church got really upset with the idea of having to persuade people to believe uh, in God. And they took rhetoric out of the curriculum. And it didn't come back up until you start getting the Reformation and you start getting uh, teaching like in advertising and marketing and pub publicity. And pub all that stuff is baby rhetoric. It's just coming yeah. back up within new fields. And, and is that because when, when you understand rhetoric that you are kind of armed against it as well, you can um, dismiss it more, you, you understand what's being, what's being done? Yeah, rhetoric's both an offensive tool, so it's a way of getting a message out into the world in an effective way, and it's, it's defense. You can also take other messages down. You can depower other messages. And my thing, rhetoric warriors that I started is essentially one of the taglines, it's the, the power of ethical only persuasion. And that's because um, I'm, I'm always pushing rhetoric to do the good things in the world and to fight the bad things in the world. And that's why ethics gets swept, swept up so much into rhetoric. Right. And, and that's what Aristotle wanted it for, right? He said it could be a, a tool for revealing the truth and putting good things out into the world. And uh, I think it was Plato, perhaps, who was a bit more skeptical of that. Uh, you got them backwards. Plato was the okay. idealist and, and Aristotle was the pragmatician. So Aristotle was like, it can go either way, but you should understand it no matter what. And Plato was more of ideals, you know, the Republic, uh, a collection of the best people making the best choices because they have the best information. Um, so, yeah. All right. I, I think I was basing that on some, something I read, but I, I got it wrong. But luckily for me, I'm not a, a professor of rhetoric, otherwise that would be very embarrassing. But it's been great to be uh, put straight on that. I think what's what I'd really like to get into then is where you first encountered rhetoric and, and what your interest was in that. So I've never been, I'm not a classical rhetorical scholar. Like I don't study the Greeks or the Romans. That's not really my thing or even the Middle, middle Age. Uh, a lot of really smart people from the church were writing about things like um, public messaging. But I studied pop culture and entertainment. So rhetoric can study any message for how, how is it effective once it's out in the world? How is it designed? What is it doing to people? And so it's literally the study of any type of public messaging. And even it goes down to private messaging too. But so I, uh, I was a pop culture and story person. So I, I ended up teaching TV writing and film writing, screenwriting, because I, I looked at how do you abstract what like mainstream American film has a very strong structure that's been developed over 100 years of actually creating those types of stories. And when I taught screenwriting, I would abstract out the mainstream American film format and I'd be like, here it is, follow the pattern and you can be a screenwriter. And then the students would all be like, I don't like following patterns. I'm like, <laughs> sorry, rhetoric doesn't go away just because you don't like it. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I had uh, a guest on the show a while back, a guy called Matthew Dix, who I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he's won like the Moth Story Slam in the US like, multiple times, I think may maybe very close to <laughs> or more than more than 50 times now. We're talking about storytelling and, and he's saying like, once you understand the structure of this, the stories are kind of all the same. You can predict the films, you know where it's going to go. And, uh, and just it, once you understand the storytelling structure, you kind of have to switch that part of yourself off if you want to enjoy and be surprised by films anymore. And I guess you're saying a, a similar kind of thing here as well. Well, essentially, there's formal rhetoric, and it has this massive history and set of techniques and things you can study. But there's also informal rhetoric, like that 
is a rhetorician. He's a story based rhetorician. Like the moth, it's just like TED Talks. They develop very strong structures and they repeat them over and over again because they work. Like, I don't know if you've noticed, but like if you watch TED Talks, they all sound almost exactly alike. Yeah, there's a structure. They all, they all have the same beat, they have the same performance, they have the same tones. It kind of drives me crazy at a certain point because it's gotten <laughs> so patterned that it's not interesting anymore. Yeah, and that's we can probably, yeah. Yeah, as I said, we can probably thank all the people who are out there training TED Talks because they probably watched all the TED Talks and and they're putting out all the stuff that makes it work, right? So they're teaching other people how to do it in that format and therefore the structure gets repeated and passed on and passed on and that's how, when that's how everyone's doing it, that's how everyone does it, right? Well, and that's the dominant form of instruction in all rhetoric, all persuasion, all story structure, whatever. It's standard, it's learning standard practices and then repeating those. The problem with that is just like I have a marketing agency here in Austin and almost all marketing agencies and ad agencies basically do standard practices and they may be very good at it. But if you bring in, you know, you've got a new Band-Aid type of Band-Aid to sell, they're going to put it into the system like this is how we sell Band-Aids and it's going to be little kids and they're, you know, hurt elbows and but all oh, the Band-Aid makes them feel better because it's been standardized as a standard practice type of messaging. What yeah. rhetoricians do is come in and they say they see that and they're like, hey, we we can get more uh, success if we interrupt that pattern, if we add something new, if we do something different with that pattern. And rhetoricians are super aware of things like standard practices, and they try not to just use that because it, it loses its power if that's all you're doing. On the other hand, if you do it really well. It's it's accepted by the culture. The culture is what right. they expect. Yeah, so, so the, the norm, so it doesn't go too far away from people's expectations for sure. What, one of the things that first got me interested in, in rhetoric, and I've always, I say always, but probably for the last 20 years or so, I've been fascinated by influence and persuasion. There, there was a book I came across, it was, a, it was a guy called Mark Joyner, if you've ever heard of him. And he wrote a book called Mind Control Marketing. And I just found it really interesting that there were all these hidden persuasion tools, these ways of getting people to, to buy stuff, to follow a certain path, that you don't know are being used on you on a day to day, and and Cialdini talks about it, and you know there are some very popular names who talk about influence and persuasion, although it tends to be again within very specific kind of elements. And I, I've tried with this show to explore a lot of different aspects of that, and that's one of the reasons why I was particularly keen to talk to you because we haven't really talked much about rhetoric on this show, but I really want to because I, the more I read about it, the more I think people should know this. People should know what rhetoric is because especially when it's in so much political messaging, and right now we have so much going on politically that we don't always recognize what's being used. And I know you have a very strong kind of stance on, on rhetoric and, and politics as well. And uh, you, you like to try and uh, challenge perhaps more conservative opinions based on using rhetoric and conversation, right? Well, I'll, I'll challenge any strong opinion set just because it doesn't matter if it's on the right or the left, just the right is dominant right now in a lot of ways with, um, with unethical rhetoric. Like the problem isn't what you believe. You can believe whatever you want. It's fine with me. The problem is the process of getting there. Did you follow, did your side follow an ethical pathway or an unethical pathway? And if you followed an unethical pathway to get people to vote for you or to believe what you want them to believe, then that needs to be fought. That needs to be taken out of the system because unethical rhetoric, while powerful, has sex. And so what I do with conservatism is take people back. I don't care. Like You can tell me like Anthony Fauci uh, has a red tail and, you know, is purposefully giving coronavirus to everybody all by himself. He's the yeah. devil, right? I'm like, great. So let's go back into process and show me why he's the devil. Take me through it. And so that's why I was saying, like, my second book is on logic, um, because what's happening is people can't go back into their own process and trace it. Like they just jump out to conclusion and they can't sit in process because it's so screwed up. They're so untrained in it, and it's been so skewed by the right-wing uh, media and the right-wing infrastructure 
that you can't go back and even clean up their thought process. And that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. The and, 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 the same yeah. thing. Millennials, like yeah. millennials get over triggered and they, they jump to conclusions. They won't go back to look at evidence or subtlety or nuance in what somebody has says. So they just judge. And yeah. again, that's that's an issue. That's the cancel cancel culture thing, right? Kind of. I mean, cancel culture itself is a little piece of rhetoric. That's just, you know, it's a rhetoric soccer ball. Like that term every once in a while, you're getting a new term about every week or two now that's jumping up. It's got a little bit of juice and a critical race theory, you know, um, and they'll kick it back and forth for a while and then it'll go away because it can only have every soccer ball only has so much energy in the media. Once you hear it too many times, it loses its energy. One, one of the things that I found fascinating when I first started reading and learning about rhetoric, and I didn't really understand perhaps quite how it fitted at first, was about logical fallacies and um, and cognitive dissonance and, and biases and things like that. And the more the more I started to understand, the more more I recognised it. But it is important to know that stuff for making rhetoric work, right? I and mean, you talked about log logic a few times, but I think again most people probably don't know what logical fallacies even are, same as most people probably haven't heard of rhetoric unless they've had a certain kind of education. Yeah, most people don't even know what logic is. They've heard the word and they think they know what it is, but they don't know what it is. Like if you ever go back and actually study real logic, you'll you'll want to, you know, stick your head in the sand for a month because it's so tedious. Like mathematical logic and propositions and propositional logic is so tedious. Yeah, yeah. And when I try to teach logic, like even just moving back into the surface structures that keep logic together, like I mentioned just there, like a conclusion is at the end of logic. You don't start with a conclusion in logic. You start with a proposition, you know, or even before that, you start with, you know, a question. And so, like, if we ask the question, is Tony Fauci credible? Is he reliable? Can we trust him? That's where you start a logical process. You don't end it with, you can't trust Tony Fauci. Got changes his mind all the time. Hmm. Like, no, you just ruined logic. Now we have to go back at the beginning and move our way through it. And because we're used to consumption thinking, like speed thinking, from many, many topics with horrible information being dumped in there, we, we just reject logic entirely. And so yeah. if you get, if you go back and get in training in rhetoric, you're going to get some training in logic. You're going to get some training in uh, argument. You're going to get training in story. That's why the book is called 21 Colosseums, because every one of those is a strong area of persuasion that you need to be trained in if you're going to be a master rhetorician. Because you have to understand, oh, I'm losing here in logic. I'm going to jump over to relationship. Like, I can't convince you with words or logical thought, so I'm going to create a good relationship with you. And if I can make that strong enough, then I can go back later over to logic and I can start taking you through that a little bit. Yeah. Do you, do you think that the same processes that you come to believe something with have to be the same processes that you maybe can be disabused by, or, or is it really following a different path that's going to help people to change their minds on things? Um, change, like going in, you're talking going in and doing like retrieval or... Uh, if you, if you were looking to try and uh, lead somebody to, like say someone has a very clearly um, wrong belief that they've been given, perhaps they've been watching Fox News a little bit too much. And so it was fairly easily debunked. What's the process really for helping them to helping them to debunk it to see the truth of it well there's a really big difference in debunking something and changing somebody's brain like you can if, if somebody is off logic so sitting on here's one of the weird things about logic it looks like it's a real thing it looks like it exists in the world but you can overlay skewed logic right on top of it and it looks almost exactly the same and this is the big, big problem people are having right now. My second book is called Why America Can't Think, especially why the world can't think. But it's because skewed logic has been laid over top of regular logic. And once your brain can't distinguish between those, 
then you, you can't use rationality anymore to make your decisions. And you can't use rationality to pull somebody out of skewed logic. It's really hard. So mm. you have to move over to something else, something like story, you know, or ethos where I use my character, my leadership of you, the fact that you trust me to pull you out of something. You know, even like the way people deprogram people in cults, you have to get people away from the cult. You have to isolate them with people who are going to talk rationally again. And slowly their brain will start to reorient. But the human neurology will adjust constantly. And once it's adjusted over to something that's a, an extreme viewpoint that's built through skewed logic, you have to, you know, sometimes do really extreme things to get their brain back to I don't know, it's original factory settings. And, and I guess there are times when that's not even possible where, where people manage to just stay, maybe stay ahead of that, or they're just so locked into a certain kind of way of thinking that they perhaps can't come out of it or don't want to come out of it. It doesn't matter whether they want to come out of it or not. Like you can bring people out of things. It's just repetition, really. The human brain will create new neurons and will kind of, more fluid neurons, more used, more used pathways through repetition. So if I just say to you every day, John, you know, that's a great beard you've got. Love your beard, man. If I just say that every day, your brain's going to start to expect it. Right. It's going to grow in strength, you know, over time. And you'll be like, man, he really loves my beard. <laughs> and that's just going to start existing in your head as a thought pathway whether you want it to or not. Like when I do, I do all sorts of things with conservative thought, but um, one is if you want to start people, you know, off, to move them off what you talk about, like really get trapped into a thought pattern, you can use thought thorns as I call them. So if you can put a little thorn, a little painful thought that goes against what they believe into their head so that it comes up when, they're exposed to this stuff, it lowers the experience for them. So for example, Fox News, which is clearly, if you understand propaganda, if you understand brainwashing techniques, things like this, they follow the techniques almost exactly. Yeah. And they're very good at it. Okay. So it's not a news organization. It's a brain training organization. <laughs> right. That's what they do. They train brains. They train them to be very highly emotionally triggered be uh, conspiratorial, because that's the, the things they do over and over again. They sell these stories over and over again. So if I want to put a little thorn in there about Fox News, I'll say, well, you know, Fox News isn't even an American company. Like, it's a foreign company. The guy who started it, Rupert Murdoch, is Australian, and then he became British, and then Ronald Reagan just tested him with a magic wand and made him American so that he could own a major network. Who else, what other country would we allow to have a major network, a fourth major network in America? Like if China had come over here or any Middle Eastern country and said, you know what, we want Al, Al Jazeera to be the fourth network in America. It would never have worked. It only worked because Rupert Murdoch's white and because he mimicked all the news things that were already there and we couldn't tell the difference between white people. It's like, oh, they're white. I guess, you know, they're just like Cronkite. <laughs> and so it's a foreign entity. It's a propaganda machine that we allowed to be in the middle of our country. Yeah. Why would we do that? Yeah. Th th thankfully, recently, there, there's been um, a, a, an attempt at a UK version of, of this, which, which they've called GB News. But it doesn't seem to be doing very well. And that's why I say thankfully. Uh, it seems that, that one of their one of their key presenters has already left, and their viewing figures are really low. And that, well, hopefully, hopefully it stays that way and, and disappears pretty soon. But it's very much the same format. But we see that pop up a lot everywhere. But it is pretty dangerous, right? All the stuff in the world. We, we talk about like eth ethical persuasion, ethical influence. But there is so much of it out there now. And this is why I think it's so important that. There was a mission. I feel like I'm on a mission to help enlighten other people whilst I'm on my journey of discovering more about influence and persuasion and helping people to understand it and apply it in more ethical ways. That 
I hope I'm also helping to arm people against it being used on them, or at least give them more of an opportunity to do that. And I feel that that's like a, a really important part of my my mission. And I, I sense that that's important for you as well. Uh, when you read the introduction to Cialdini's books, he talks about that being important to him as well. Now, there's all these people out there who already know how to use this stuff against you. And probably they figured it out, they don't have the ethics, uh, they're stopping them from doing it. But most of us don't know how this stuff works and don't learn it. So I see it as a real tool of empowerment to have this. Yeah, I mean, that's the idea, right? There's, there's only a few things you can do to clean up public discourse. You can try to eliminate nefarious people. Trump gets kicked off Twitter and Facebook and the world changes the silence that broke out in america was insane it was like four years of you know discord and suddenly it's quiet yeah you know and so you can you can create laws or rules or practices to keep unethical persuaders out of your public discourse which i encourage like everybody hides behind free speech as like oh it's just an open door to anybody i'm like if you ever throwing a party and a bunch of bikers show up you know, what do you do? Do you like, oh, yeah, let the bikers in. Your party's going to be just fine. No, you, you make some rules. You put at least a velvet rope up, you know, so you, you have to have some type of system that's more advanced than just, hey, it's free speech. They can say whatever they want. Well, no, they can't. Right. So that's one way is to make some rules for who gets in and doesn't get into your public discourse. And then secondly, to um, arm people so that they can see that stuff. The nice thing about like OAN and uh, Newsmax and GB, I guess is the one in uh, Great Britain coming along after Fox is Fox has already alerted everyone to this stuff being uh, different. You know, so there is some protection now, like the, the population has learned some stuff. When yeah. Fox first came out, there was no, you know, outcry about, hey, don't let this propaganda machine onto my network. And they hide behind, they use very specific techniques of masquerading and appropriation. Like their original uh, slogan of fair and balanced, that's a new slogan. And it's a complete lie. That is exactly the opposite of what they do. If they would have come out and said, hey, we are a propaganda organization. We are unbalanced. We are trying to sell this set of ideas to you. Then I would have probably been okay with it. Right. The problem is when they deny it's unethical to you know be non-transparent and so they deny that they're this and they constantly are in denial I'm like nah so if you train people that's the second thing is you know get them to where they can see this stuff and the third thing is sort of like what you're doing and this is kind of what i do and why i started rhetoric warriors is we need a like a, a guardians of the galaxy but for by rhetoricians <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I'm, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. Right? I mean, I'll, I'll be the little raccoon guy. <laughs> they're highly funded. They're incredibly, you know, highly theoretical. They've got, they employ great writers and great artists. And the people on Fox News are amazing performers. It's too much for regular people to try to resist. So, yeah, yeah we need rhetor rhetorical, rhetorician guardians of the galaxy. That's why I, 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 like, I like this. Word. That's why I called it that. Yeah, yeah, I like the sound of it. I like the sound of it. Uh, it definitely sounds sounds like more, a lot of fun as well, rather than uh, in complex and deep stuff. So, I, I'm curious what what your thoughts on are about education in in rhetoric. I mean, perhaps it would be good to to explain some of the foundational principles of, of rhetoric, the sort of ethos, uh, pathos, and logos part of it uh, for for people who may not be too familiar with those. Do you mean? Um, do I think it should be taught? Uh, in schools and stuff like that, or I, I guess it's like more at least more commonly taught, even if it's at more higher education levels. But uh, I think a lot of people don't get to come into contact with it in in any way, shape, or form, other than when it's being used uh, and and wouldn't necessarily recognize it. Yeah, it becomes a political issue within the educational ecosystem. Like English departments teach rhetoric too. So my degree is in speech communication. So it's in the speech tradition and rhetoric. And then there's a written tradition of rhetoric and they use the same tools, the same argument tools and persuasion tools. Uh, so English departments own persuasive speaking or persuasive writing. 
you know, and you'll get a little bit of that. Like when you take your basic English courses, you'll have to write essays that argue for things. Uh, usually most people in college have to take a public speaking course and that's a baby rhetoric course. Like how do you create a good message so that it, you know, has the right effects that you want. And usually you have to do some type of persuasive speech yeah. and you'll get a little bit of debate here and there in high schools. And some people take that. So there is a little bit of educational foundation uh, in it, but um, again, like most, most schools have a rhetoric department. You just never hear about it. It's not one of the power departments uh, on most campuses. Communication studies is more known than rhetoric, which is a subset of communication studies. So um, I don't know, that was kind of my thing. Like I taught, I was a professor for 20 years and I taught 18 year olds about rhetoric. And then they're like, yeah, whatever. And they forget it and they go on with their lives. Right. And when I stopped teaching around 2000, I decided, you know, I had all this stuff and it wasn't until Trump showed up, Mr. Rhetoric Viking and broke politics like a big pinata. And I'm like, people need some of this stuff. So I move it over to like podcasts and books and online courses and things like that. Because I mean, that is available now. Like podcasts, I think is an amazing way of distributing information. I have yeah. 20 interviews on my podcast of with hardcore rhetoricians. And if you just listen to those, they're an hour, hour, 15 minutes long, you're going to learn a lot about rhetoric. Like I have a friend who um, I went to grad school with and she was in interpersonal communication. And so she, and she was, and she sent me a note that said she had listened to all the episodes about rhetoric. And she's like, I learned way more uh, from these podcasts than I ever did in grad school. Isn't that the way now? Yeah, yeah, because uh, you, you can you can do so much more with them. It's a much more flexible learning tool. And uh, I, it seems to be that the audio format is becoming more and more popular with people. I mean, is, I think that's we're going to see a lot more of it as well. Facebook's in on the act now and uh, with podcasting and Netflix are making podcasts into TV shows and things as well. Like, people are loving the, the format uh, and a lot's coming out of it and, and also finding it's something that they can enjoy anywhere. Like I, I will listen to podcasts whilst I'm walking to my office and back or whilst I'm in the gym and because I'd rather have that on their music. And I think a lot of people are, are doing that kind of things on their commutes, in the car, um, audiobooks and podcasts. It's a, it's a very powerful format now. It seems to be becoming more and more popular, interestingly. Yeah, and I hope that's true. Like the Nazis uh, in 1930s gave out transistor radios to everybody, free transistor radios so that they could hear Hitler's speeches. You know, so having some area of some easily accessed technology that could carry messaging to people is important. And podcasts, you know, like they're, so I, I also have a big background in comedy and entertainment. And I worked in Hollywood for a long time. And I, so I try to bring as much of that as I can to the podcast format to make it entertaining, but they're, they're right-wing comedians who have podcasts. Yeah, but are they you funny? Know, are they funny, Dan? <laughs> you know, it's really hard. I, I wrote for Dennis Miller for a little while, who became a right-wing right fellow. I, I remember Dennis Miller, yeah. And he, he started out as a very, you know, a liberal prince. He was the John Stewart of his day. And he moved over to become right-wing. And um, I used to say, you know, it's really hard to do comedy downward. Like people just cringe when you take shots, when either you glorify people who are clearly evil in power or you take shots at people who are clearly trying to do good stuff in the world. And he would do it all the time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's cringy to hear that stuff, but there are some good comics. There's a guy, Nick, uh, what's his last name? Uh, Nick DiPaolo, who was a great club standup. I think he's lost his mind to the right, but he's still got all the club stand-up techniques, even on his podcast. So it sounds like it should be funny. It's not always funny, but it sounds like it should be. <laughs> yeah, is it, I mean, politics, but perhaps not really a, a left or a right thing. But I think when you start getting into ideologies and perhaps a wrong, just clear wrong thinking, as you say, is it's hard to find that funny. It's hard to find things that are, where, where someone's actually, you know, punching down or, uh, or as you say, uh, 
proclaiming some something is good that really that really isn't then that's hard to find funny for sure now I, i've had a lot of comedians funny speakers and professional comedians on the show because i i find comedy is a tool that doesn't get talked about that much as a tool of persuasion as a tool of influence but i think it really is it is, is actually a very powerful one that perhaps a lot of academia I, I could be wrong on this but you would maybe know better than i do but a lot of academia seems to have missed it as a tool of influence and persuasion what, what do you think well i think it can be pulled over and used as a tool of influence and persuasion but that's not its design no comedy doesn't owe you any moral uh work it doesn't owe society any any you know advance it doesn't owe anybody it gets pulled over and then once you pull it over into stuff like that it changes the nature of the comedy comedy is just there to create laughs that's the world this whole circle the whole you know enclosed space that is comedy it's just laughs it's trying to find entertainment value if you pull it over and start making it do social good political work things like that it breaks pretty quickly Right. Like even like when I've seen John Stewart try to do you know sort of actual politics and political events, it just falls flat. Yeah, you know, it's just not the nature of comedy. But it is. It can be used in a lot of ways to do things with audiences that you know are powerful, and then you can slip persuasion and influence in there. I, I think that it's more. Well, I, I view it that when you're making people laugh, you, you become more influential. If people see you as someone who's funny and makes them laugh, you are influential to them. You have kind of put yourself almost in a power position to them to, to a degree, although they might you know, hopefully they feel connected to you and related to you, but you have an influence over them. They see you as a particular kind of thing. And that does at least allow the opportunity to perhaps plant some seeds or challenge the status quo. Uh, and you certainly have seen th throughout the years, I mean, you, people like John Stewart, people like uh, Bill Hicks, uh, people like, I, I guess people will talk about like Letty Bruce and guys like that, but going, going quite far back there. Uh, but you know, George Carlin, perhaps a more recent uh, e example, although he's no longer with us as well. But that it is a possibility to challenge, at least challenge the authority and um, challenge the status quo and get people thinking about things, even if you're not actually necessarily directly making a point. Yeah, it can definitely do all that. It just doesn't have to. No. Like I hear people, you know, who will jump on comedians about, you know, their bad morals or their, you know, bad, po and I'm like, it doesn't matter. Are they funny? Do they make you laugh? That's the end of the conversation in comedy. If they want to be, you know, a blend of comedian and social justice warrior or a seller of a social perspective or political perspective, that's fine. But it's that's not really a comedian anymore. That's a that's at least a blend. And it's a hard one to pull off. Yeah. You, know, you see guys like Hicks and stuff like that who are good at counterculture and punching upward and, you know, they can find some of that. But it it runs out of gas pretty quickly. Like even Carlin, the last three or four specials Carlin did were more like an old dude grousing and bitching than right. straight up stand up anymore. You know, uh, if you watch it, there are far fewer punchlines and much more, you know, just general irritation. So comedy, comedy is very, it's, it's a very specialized way of talking for human beings. And um, I, I, Typically, it's not that I resist it being used rhetorically because I use comedy as rhetoric. Like I use it to do information, especially like when I bring conservatives on my show and I do conversions. I use a lot of comedy because it makes them feel comfortable and it, it lowers the stakes. And suddenly, you know, we're, we're having fun instead of fighting each other. You know, and those are all comedy techniques, but it's really just a specialized way that I use comedy. It's not, I don't expect comedy mm. to do that for me all the time. How, how many, how many conservatives have you converted then, would you say? Oh, every conservative I talk to, I convert. Yeah. It's not a full conversion, but I will move them a few centimeters towards a direction I want them to move. You know, I, the interesting thing is like, again, with the book, the reason why I split, I split, persuasion so strongly into different areas. It's because when you ask me about conversion, like I'm really trying to do relationship persuasion with conversions because 
I've seen this over and over again. The strongest way to convert somebody out of a political perspective is to create relation, let them create relationships with people who are their villains and they can't hold on to their, their hate, their judgment, their negative evaluation. Once they get in and like, Oh, I kind of like this guy, you know, I kind of like this trans person or this, you know, uh, poverty, you know, they don't, whatever it is that they've been told to hate, if they meet them and, and have a relationship, it converts them off that, that stands. Yeah. So that's the strongest way to convert somebody from politics. And so even just meeting me and I don't identify as a liberal, like I identify as a comedian. <laughs> I would choose that as my political persuasion as well. If that's an option. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I, I the only reason I really like liberals better than conservatives is they laugh much easier. Oh my God. Conservatives don't like to, they're so triggery. It's no fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, that, that's somewhat true in the UK now as well. I don't think it quite used to be. I, I think they they used to be able to find some humour and perhaps even laugh at themselves a bit. And now it's uh, now, now uh, the similar things have been happening in the UK where um, like satire and stuff is, is is kind of an attack. Like there was a fairly popular satire show that was running. I've, I've had one of the guys who was on it uh, on as a guest as well on the show. It's called. Uh, I, I'm going to forget what it's called now. Um, never mind, but <laughs> it was it was a great little show, but it was, I guess it came across as being kind of left wing and um, and it, it got pulled because the, the government have a lot of sway with the BBC, everyone's having the BBC, right? Uh, and so because of that, this show got, uh, ended up getting canceled. And, uh, and it seems that you know, they're really doing some bits to try and quiet dissent. And, and I was, actually watching uh, YouTube videos where someone was talking about that, uh, that Trump had been investigating the possibilities of having the DOJ investigating certain like late night comedians and the likes that he didn't like about whether they could prosecute them. It's like that, that is a, it's a definitely sort of a, a dodgy dictator kind of move to try and silence any sort of political dissent or opposition. Uh, and they were talking about this, this comedian in Egypt who's ha now had to exile, be exiled to um, LA. You may, you may, be aware of who, who he is. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but um, the, because he was uh, satirizing the powers that be uh, in Egypt, um, they came after him, and he had to he had to leave, and and he still still can't go back there. But it seems that you know, comedy itself has has a lot of power. But uh, people people don't like being being challenged, uh, and the the political figures. Uh, um spouting the rhetoric but they they you know they want the free speech but they're actually silencing it in other people they say they're all about free speech but they want everyone else to shut up right and that's unethical so yeah there you go it, you know all these issues they they like to me one of the dominant terms that explains modern rhetoric is conflation like everything gets conflated together and we have such a hard time extracting it to be able to think our way through it so freedom of speech, like Trump supposedly is now going to uh, sue Twitter and Facebook for <laughs> pulling him off their, off their platform. Uh -huh. And, you know, and they keep claiming free speech. Well, that's why I said free speech. Free speech needs some work. It needs some rhetoric work done on it to define it because it shouldn't be free speech. It should be, you know, it's not free hate speech. It's, it's not, you know, free to say unethical things. It's not free, free, you know, to lie, but that's the way it's being used. Yeah. And so everybody's like, well, you can't restrict it. I'm like, yeah, you can, sure you can. We're, you know, we have this huge technology. We're incredibly advanced. You can't tell me we can't actually look at things and do some good, you know, trimming of it. Like we're not at the mercy of the language. The language is kind of at our mercy. So do some actual work on it. Again, it's the rhetorician thing. Rhetoricians would be like, you know, one of my taglines for what I do with rhetoric warriors is uh, complicated times require sophisticated techniques. And we haven't kept up. Yeah. So like this idea of free speech has not been turned into free speech 2.0. Like democracy hasn't been turned into democracy 2.0. And it needs it. Like it has all these vulnerabilities because it was made 250 years ago or whatever in America. And so it's a vulnerable system. And all the right is doing is exploiting the vulnerabilities in the system. You know, so fix them and you'll get rid of these nefarious people 
and the power that they can grab. And they keep trying to stop you from fixing it because then they'll be out of power. Of course. Yeah, yeah. So the, the will isn't there to change the change the political systems, which are all clearly broken because uh, so many of these um, corrupt types who are uh, sort of, uh, kleptocracy kind of government to who are uh, putting putting stuff out there and are putting out all this harmful rhetoric and division and all that they're, they're too easily in power and like in, in the uk the government there has a ridiculous majority because people have bought into it and, and bought into all this rhetoric and 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 i guess also in the lack of uh, there there's something of a lack of um strong opposition as well is that the opposition hasn't really done a very good job of combating any of that and i think that they could be a lot better on it but uh yeah it's probably just as true here in spain although most of other parts of europe and many other parts of the world now seeing more coalition governments which maybe may be a better thing where yeah they're... maybe that maybe that's part of the democratic answer i yeah. you know i tell people all the time like i just started this brand six months ago during the pandemic where i could you know sort of lift all this stuff out of academics and out of all the work I did for all these years teaching it over into a public format that is more adapted. It's at least adapted to podcasting. It's not quick. It's not completely adapted yet to like quick, quick media like Twitter and Instagram and things like that, which wants consumption messages like really short and, and singular. But, you know, training people, even the left, training Democrats, training the left against nefarious unethical persuasion is not an easy thing you know it is not easy to fight this and they're not ready they are not trained they are not rhetoricians they're politicians and so there's they keep going back to using trying to use the same things they've always used and they can that stuff can be blown up so easily like the only reason biden really got elected here is because he had 40 years of history and he's a white guy he's male a uh, super familiar everybody knows the brand you know so all the people that you know on the right couldn't hate him as much as they mm. could hate hillary so the hate factor went down to like 20 percent because they didn't know how to hate that guy right you know and so but how do you fight hate i mean that's different than fighting you know political ideologies just sheer hate and you've watched them do it now like they turned they turned it on fauci They've t turned it on Biden and the Biden hate factor is starting to go up because those techniques are super powerful, partly because, you know, they're they're good at it and partly because we don't know how to fight it. Like even if you just turn the fire hose around and point it at Trump and just use the things that the right hates and just say it about Trump, like they, they pick the wrong things, like calling Trump a fascist or a you know, a dictator or things like that. The right doesn't even understand what that means. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's really not that strong and they don't care. Like yeah. they would be perfectly fine turning these governments to fascists if the fascism was, you know, it was Christian, it was organized, you know, around what they want. They'd be, they'd be fine with that. We don't need elections, just we need the right people in power. So, yeah. you know, calling things that they hate, you know, like what do they hate? Well, they hate overeducated people, you know, I, I'm still surprised. He, Trump's such an interesting guy, but him being a New Yorker and the fact that the South loves him is amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I, don't, I don't get it. Rich boy, New Yorker. If they just kept hitting him with that. Yeah, although it seems there are some revelations that he may not be quite so rich after all. <laughs> yeah, but none of it matters. Again, they, they don't, they're okay. not using logic. So it doesn't matter yeah. whether he is or isn't. Like, they're listening to stories. So just put a big thing on there. Trump hates Jesus. Right. Like, Trump is a Jesus hater. And again, propaganda and rhetoric is, will tell you, repeat. Repeat that over and over again. It makes no difference whether it's true or not. Yeah. And it will start to rise up as a belief, and then it'll hurt Trump. Yeah, I mean, there have been quite a lot of people who are saying Trump is probably really an atheist, so it doesn't doesn't really believe in anything. And uh, but yeah, again, maybe just hasn't been enough of it, or hasn't hasn't been repeated enough. It needs to be in the public discourse, and that does seem to be something that, uh, particularly the the right the right wing does do very well about keeping that discourse going, keeping those, they're controlling the talking points and the the language that's being used, the hyperbole that's going into it as well. I, I took a, a, an interesting program that what about uh, it was like an audio course. Um, it was really a, an audio book that 
is no longer available as, as, as a proper course, but you may have heard of it. It's called A Way With Words. It was uh, Professor Drought. It's a course on on rhetoric, particularly, and it's, it's available on uh, on Audible. That's where, where I heard it. Uh, and he was talking about some of the things like, uh, one of the things I find particularly interesting was saying that particular rhet rhetorical devices, when overused, people do start to become uh, immune to it weaker it weakens them and they're not they're not so effective anymore things like the uh tricolon for example you know, the, the three uh, power of three thing that if, if it's overused people get a bit oh god another one of those you know it, it loses a lot of impact and power um but what what are, you, what are your thoughts perhaps on the the effectiveness or the perhaps some of the differences of where you see uh, rhetoric going like what's changing there what's effective was effective before it isn't so much now well, I start the book with this kind of five level separation of rhetoric into like theory, strategy, tactics, situations, and then specifics. So specifics are the micro techniques when you go all the way down into like that. Like when you repeat things in threes, that's a, it's a thing in comedy, it's a thing in the human brain. Our short term memory can hold about three things. And so that typically is a good pattern if you're going to be using messaging on humans. But like take the insult thing. So Trump is a insult person. Like he insults. That's one of his techniques. Yeah. And um, he knows that insults only last a couple of days, two or three days. So he'll change his target every two or three days. And then once people forget the insult, he'll pull one thing out of that insult and circle back and just reuse it every once in a while. So if we know that Trump is an insulter, I used to call him the insulter in chief, you know, that's what he does. Yeah. Well, how do you, con how do you counteract uh, insults? Like that What? so the rhetorician in me is like, okay, great. I've now identified one of this guy's tactics. I need a counter program to that tactic. So I think like uh, if Hillary Clinton had just hired a really good insult comic to uh, give her some good lines for the debates, she'd have probably won. Yeah. Who, who, who in your insults, opinion would be a good, uh, who in your opinion would be a good insult comic for her to have hired? Oh my God, there's so many. There's a guy <laughs> here, Dave Attell, who, you know, is just a, I used to call him the filthy poet, it's just a master of these really sharp one liners. And that's what you want. And if you just hired that guy, it's like, look, we want 300 hardcore insults about Trump. And then you just aren't Biden or whoever going out there with fresh insults. You know, it, it would decimate him because he's not used to being insulted by an artist. Yeah, he's used to being insulted by people who aren't good at insulting. <laughs> like Hillary Clinton tried to insult his followers and it was the right. clumsiest insult I've ever heard. Yeah, the life. basket of deplorables. That was, that was pretty poor. Yeah. Yes. Basket of deplorables. What the, that sounds like it came from the middle ages. Like <laughs> who uses the word deplorable anymore? Why a basket? It's just a weird image. It's a horrible insult. I'm like that guy sitting, standing right next to you is so insultable. There's so many things about him that you could insult. Yeah, and, and, so and it was so tame. Yeah, it was so tame that they were, they were using it as a badge of honor. They, that people were changing their profiles to deplorable, right? Yeah, they pulled it down after a while. I mean, that's the other thing about rhetoric is like it can re-inhabit symbols. Symbols are really hard to control. Hmm. Even like the, the right has taken all the democratic symbols, like the flag and colors and all this stuff, and they've turned them into hate symbols. Like they drive around in the trucks and as soon as you see you're like, oh, that person is a horrible person, which is a crazy thing to do with America's primary symbols, but they've done it. So there's always this fight about defining symbols, which is another area of rhetoric uh, definitions, but just insults like, you know, just, hey, if you know you're going up against an insult, so you better get ready, you know, to, to defend those insults. You know, Biden just ignored them for the most part. But he could do that because he already had a bunch of rhetorical ethos and there wasn't that much to insult about biden now they're insulting him about his cognitive abilities because he's old and that's the only thing they've been kind of been able to make stick 
Right. <laughs> Although he still seems much more cog cognitively capable than the, the main opposition. Um, it's interesting. He's saying saying about um, the symbols. Uh, I remember doing my English degree. Signs, symbols, signifiers, semiotics. Right? That that is related to rhetoric as well. Then. Yeah. Again, rhetoric was the uh, fount. It was the original fleur de lis. It was like it created all of the stuff, and all these other academic areas have come up to rediscover what the Greeks were talking about 2,500 years ago. And right. semiotics, you know, the splitting of language and all that stuff, you can find most of that in Greek writings. You know, the idea of what are words and what are they constructed of and what do they do and how do you take control of that? That's all rhetoric. And, you know, you came up with, you know, through the, through the academy, you know, like the Russian structuralist and then the semiologists and, you know, all these different people breaking the sign apart, and breaking the word apart. It's all been done in rhetoric. You just didn't read it. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally different, different areas, the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing, right? Um, in, in, interesting stuff. I know, I know we need to start wrap, wrapping things up pretty soon, but uh, it, it's been a, a great, hopefully a great introduction to some people to to rhetoric and understanding how it applies to their life. It, it's part of everything. It, it's everywhere. You, know, you can't really avoid it knowing what it is and perhaps knowing how to use it. I mean, do you think it is a, a critical skill for public speakers or just a nice to have? Uh, rhetoric is the super technology. I tell people it's the original human software. I mean, maybe logic is first, language, maybe language is first first. <clears throat> but right after that, it's how do you use language to get what you want? And that's the real question that rhetoric is answering for you. It's like when we talk to people, we want something. We want we want things to happen. Even if we're trying to get them to smile back at us and have a pleasant conversation, you're trying to make that happen. So every time we talk, we're really being rhetorical. And so when you train people about rhetoric, everybody's worried about it going over into manipulation, which sure. is just a, you know, it's just a piece of slander about rhetoric because uh, everybody's afraid of rhetoric. Like, why shouldn't you understand how rhetoric works? It's the original software for creating good relationships, for transferring information well, for taking care of other people, for being ethical. It does really great stuff. And that's why I kind of teach the white arts of rhetoric. Like here are all the great things rhetoric does. Yes, you can pull it over into the dark side and it will do all those things too, but it only does those if you let it. Right. If, if you don't, don't understand rhetoric and it's against you, well, guess whose fault it really is? It, yeah. It's your fault. You know, right. defend yourself. I, I have uh, I have a talk that I, I've delivered a few times now. It's uh, it's called Defense Against the Dark Arts of Persuasion. Uh, but I, I like that. I think I'm going to have to uh, ha add something in there now about the uh, the white arts of rhetoric. I, I, I like that. I, I really like that. I will credit you for sure. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Um, wh where can people come and find out more about you and more about rhetoric? What's the best way for them to do that? Rhetoric Warriors, the site is it's kind of the major location. And then I, I have all the podcasts. I have 75 episodes up on YouTube and all the platforms. And that's really the best way. It's all free information. I'm going to launch a rhetoric boot camp, like a hardcore training around the, the book, because the book is essentially, it's a quick introduction to an arena. So like when I talk about logic in there, I could write three books about logic. There's so much stuff inside of logic. But people don't have time for that. So I'm just trying to get you oriented in that. And so I may do a rhetoric boot camp about each week. I'm going to launch into a different arena and really drag people through it if you want to learn this stuff. Because learning 10% of something in this stuff is a bad idea. Because right. then you're going to launch in and you're going to be up against somebody that's good at it. And you're going to get shredded. So rhetoric is it's a battle. Uh, you know, it's one of the primary metaphors for and That's why I chose Colosseums, because you're in there and if your uncle or your dad or whatever, and you can't talk to them or your aunt or somebody has gone off the deep end or like me, I have a 21 year old daughter who's millennial and I've had to really work in order to be able to communicate well with her because she's so easily triggered. And I'm a comedian. Comedians do what I like to call, you know, uh, stomping through the minefield in clown shoes. Like if they find something that's triggerable, they, they want to explore that energy. Yeah. And my daughter doesn't like that. So we've had to work at it, but I've, I've got techniques to make adjustments so that I don't just trigger her and, and ruin the relationship. 
Whereas most people just avoid the topic. They stop trying to persuade, which is a horrible idea because now that person gets to go out and vote. You know, you need to, to control the way other people vote. That is your responsibility. You need to influence it and get it into the right, you know, modality. And if you're on the right and you're like, hey, I think the right is the way to do this. I'm like, great, use ethical techniques and jump in there. But if you want to use unethical techniques, I'm going to fight you every single centimeter you try to move. Yeah, so. bring, bring some bring some honor back into the system. And uh, that, that's definitely a good thing. I, I love that. I, I would certainly be interested in taking a course like that myself. Uh, but in the meantime, people can arm themselves with 21 Colosseums of persuasion. And uh, it is it is a great read. And, uh, you know, I haven't completed it yet, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. And I'm learning a lot from you. And uh, I certainly look forward to learning more from you as well in the future. And this has been a really delightful journey into, into rhetoric and hopefully a, a good intro, a good uh, a good reviser for people who are already a bit familiar with it. I, I want to ask you, are there any other books or resources that you would recommend? I think I will sort of give it to you, more about perhaps rhetoric or logic that you think people should uh, check out. Well, somebody asked me this recently. I think most of the problem with rhetoric is that it's either deep academics or it's textbooks. Like there aren't a lot of good mid-ground sources and that's one of the reasons why I started writing some of this stuff. If you wanna go to the original Aristotle, the rhetoric, it, it's deep, I mean, it's intricate, it's hard to follow, it's got a lot of stuff in there, but it's great. Uh, and then, you know, recently, uh, Cialdini, uh, I think has a good review book. It's a good review of, of persuasion. So I think it's a really interesting book. Yeah. And if you want to read fun stuff, like really good philosophy written by a guy who's so smart and such a great writer, but he's super academic, sorry. Uh, Kenneth Burke is the primary saint of rhetoric uh, for many, many people in the uh, rhetoric field. And he has books like Permanence and Change. It's one of my favorite books, Attitudes Towards History. He has, you know, probably 10 or 12 books that just just amazing and I, when i read them it takes me so long because every paragraph has like five ideas in it that i'm like oh i gotta learn this i gotta remember this so uh, I I like the excellent yeah i definitely like the sound of that it's going going on to my reading list it will be in there i look forward to checking that out uh, as well as reading more from you Dan, Dan, it's been a real pleasure speaking to you. What would you like to leave you with that? If there's at least maybe one thing that people take away from this that you'd like to leave in people's minds, what would it be? Uh, it's okay to persuade people. It's You should learn it. You know, you should take responsibility for it. It's not unethical. It's not manipulation. It's absolutely necessary if you're going to be happy, if you're going to be successful in business, if you're going to create a good politics, if you have a social issue that you want to push, learn how to persuade. Like just yelling at people and being expressive and passionate does nothing. Add, add some, you know, sophistication, some learning so that you can be effective. And the more effective you are getting good things in the world, then the better the world is for all of us. So I, you know, I encourage you to learn more rhetoric. <laughs> I certainly will be. I hope other people will be as well. Take up the challenge and let, let us know how you do. Don't get, tell us how you get on with your journey into rhetoric as well. Dan, this, for, for me, this has been a real treat because I love rhetoric and it's been a delight to speak to someone who has expertise in this. And uh, I've learned a lot from this. I hope other people have as well. Please, uh, please stand the light and uh, we're going to run the titles. But thank you so much for coming and being my guest on Speaking Influence. Yeah, absolutely. Super fun. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed the show. If you did, please make sure you put something into action that you learned here today. And of course, subscribe to the show if you haven't already done so. If you'd like to support the show, one of the best ways for you to do that is to share our episodes with your network. Now, of course, share the episodes that you love, or perhaps more than the ones that you don't, but word of mouth makes a huge difference to us. And you can now support the show financially as well, even just by buying me a coffee. For five US dollars a month, you can help make the Speaking Influence podcast an even bigger and better show. There's also a membership level where you can get exclusive access to our live stream recordings to be in the virtual studio with us and exclusive Q&A time with our show guests, as well as advanced information of the shows and guests that are coming up. To do that, visit the Supercast page in the show notes or in the YouTube description. If you'd like to know more about podcasting, presenting, public speaking, tools of influence and persuasion, or maybe have me as a speaker at one of your upcoming events, then please do get in touch by email. 
john at presentinfluence.com or come and find me on social media. I'd love to connect with you, even if it's just to say hello and let me know that you've enjoyed the show. For now, see you next time and go and make great things happen.